Well, good morning, church family. Oh, I'm going to say he is risen. If you'll say hallelujah, he is risen indeed. He is risen. Happy Easter to you. He is risen from the grave, and we celebrate his presence with us today. If you're a guest with us, thank you so much for being here at Brentwood today. And we're uh, going to have a wonderful time of worship. If you're visiting with us by way of live streaming, thank you for tuning in. And we invite you at your earliest convenience to join us on any of our campuses here in the Middle Tennessee area. Would you join me in welcoming all of our guests in the room and around the world watching on television today? Today's a very special day, and we want to know that you're here. And particularly, Pastor Mike wants... Uh, to know the names of people who are in our services across all of our campuses because we want to, he wants to be able to pray for a name. So I'm going to ask you to do something unusual today and pull out your phone. Would you go, everyone, just take a moment and pull out your phone. And I want you to text the word Easter to the number that you see on your screen. Text the word Easter to 615-570-3506. Go ahead and take a moment and text the word Easter to 615-570-3506. Now, three questions are going to pop up. It's going to ask for your name. An email address will be the next question. And then if you'd like for a minister to contact you, and you can say yes or no on that one, type that in and send it. So if you say yes, then we will. If you say no, of course we will not. But we want to have opportunity to pray for you by name and we want to know if we can minister to you, but we want to know that you're here today. So if you would take, we're asking everyone in every service on all of our campuses uh, to do this one thing. And uh, we'll be so glad to receive that information from you if you would share it with us. I'm going to pray for us, so we're going to pause on this. I'm going to pray, and then you'll have opportunity to continue this. Um, and our orchestra will be leading us in our call to worship. Would you pray with me, Father? We're so glad to be here and in your presence today and to celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We praise and magnify him. Prepare our hearts now to sing your praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us hope and a future and a joy that we get to lift our voice and sing His praise. I'm going to ask us to put everything we've got singing this song together. He's alive forever. Amen. Let the children church will you read this scripture with me blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading kept in heaven
here at Brentwood, we do something that we call the prayer and altar time. It's a specific moment in the service every week that we set aside the time for concentrated prayer. Today, I want to take the privilege to do that just a wee bit different today. If you would take out the bulletin that you received when you came in. And if you'll look on the inside, you'll notice that there is a tear-off. It's a perforation. And you'll see there right on the inside, it gives you opportunity. It says prayer requests, and it has those lines there. During this moment, if you would like to do so, I'm going to ask that you would take a pen in hand. And during our prayer time today, as I guide us, that you list those prayer requests that either you need to give to the Lord today or that you would give to us so that we could pray for them. We have uh, a team that's ready to receive your prayer requests and to begin to pray over them and call out your requests and you by name if you would allow us to do so. So I'm going to guide you and then as you begin to write, if the Lord would lead you to do that, later on in our service, we'll receive an offering and you can place your prayer requests in the offering plate along with your offering. And then you'll notice there are four prayer stations around the room. You can drop your prayer request, your card that you're filling out. You can drop it off there. There will be ministers at each table. And I'll be at this one. And I'll be ready, we'll be ready, if any of you would like for us to pray with you and for you, over you today, we want to do that, okay? So if you'll just bow with me and pen in hand and you begin to think of those prayer requests, I'll give you a moment. I want to guide you and then we'll pray over them together. I want to ask you, what is that one most thing that is burdening your heart today that you just need to lay at the feet of Jesus. If you want to write that on the card or just be, begin to pray about it. That one thing. What about that one thing that you're afraid that the Lord might ask you to do? That you just need to pray about. And then finally, who is that one person that you know of today that needs a touch from the Lord? It may be a family member, a friend, a co-worker, a brother or sister, a child or a parent. Or it may be you. And you may need prayer for healing or freedom from something. You may need prayer for salvation or know of someone who does. Or even just revival and renewal in your own life. anything else that comes to mind as the Lord prompts you, you place it on this card write it down and I'm going to give you just a few moments to pray over these and then I'll close this Father, you know every heart, you know our requests better than we know ourselves. Well, we have life because you have life. 
We trust you with everything that we're praying about and we give it to you. We love you. We worship you as we pray.
Praise the Lord. We're at this time in our service where we get to give our tithes and our offerings. Did you know that our special needs ministry here at Brentwood has grown over 145% in this last year? And it's not because we've tried to grow that ministry. It's because the need is so great here and in the surrounding areas. Brentwood has tried to be a, a good steward of that, and so we've garnered some space on the second floor. We've put some resources there. We brought on Tiffany McCullough as the special needs minister who trains volunteers who work with our special needs friends and ministers to their families. They do that on Sunday morning, on Wednesday nights, and they have special events all throughout the year in which they provide ministry. This year, eight of our friends, special friends, were able to go to what we call Anvil, which was a guy's retreat over the weekend. One of the friends that were there, his name was Dylan. Just a few years ago, Dylan was nonverbal, but he always did well when he was connected and interacting with other people. At Anvil, he was able to connect with peers and to leaders and to Garrett Gregory, our student pastor. And do you know that that was the first time that Dylan had ever spent a night away from home? And it made a difference in his life and it ministered to his family. There are hundreds of other stories just like Dylan that we have the opportunity to meet their needs and to minister to them. We need more space and we need additional resources to do this. And it's because of your faithfulness in this moment that will allow us to do just that. Our ushers are coming forward now and I'm gonna pray a simple prayer over us and then we'll worship together through the giving of our tithe. Would you bow with me? Father, thank you for the multiple opportunities that we have to minister in your name and to be a part of something that's greater than ourselves and to further your kingdom and particularly in this special way through our special needs ministry. Father, give us the heart to give which already belongs to you. Help us to be a good steward and manage it well and give it to further your kingdom with generous hearts. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Be seated.
I'm afraid of not knowing my purpose. I am afraid of being inadequate to face life's challenges. I'm afraid of storms. I'm afraid of not being the best teacher that I could be. Especially since my husband has died, I've had a fear of loneliness and insecurity. I'm afraid of the darkness. I'm afraid of missed opportunities. I am afraid that I will never be good enough. I'm afraid of losing those that are close to me. I'm afraid of not being enough. I used to be afraid of failure. I was afraid of losing a loved one. I was afraid of being a sufficient godly mom. I was afraid of telling people no. I was afraid of being anxious. I was afraid of failure. I was afraid of being unknown. I was afraid of being lonely. I was afraid of inadequacy. I was afraid of death. I was afraid of not being good enough. Jesus has conquered my fear of being alone because he shows me that he's always with me. I no longer fear being inadequate because Jesus has shown me that he is more than enough. I'm no longer afraid of not being good enough because I am his workmanship. Jesus conquered the fear of being unknown in my life by reminding me I am a child of God and I was fearfully and wonderfully made. I was afraid of insignificance, but Jesus gave me purpose. Jesus conquered my fear by walking ahead of me and giving me new mercies every day. Jesus has taught me that my identity is in him and he is more than enough. I no longer fear death because Jesus is risen. Have you ever been to a movie and you hated the ending? Hey, right? you're sitting there with your popcorn, following everything, and all of a sudden the credits start to roll, and you go, what? It can't be over now. You can't end the movie here. What about, and you'll name this character, and, and what about this, and you'll name this thread of the plot. You want to know what happened, and it bugs you forever. And you leave the theater mad. Right? That's not the way that thing should have ended. I need to know the end of the story. I want to know what happened. And you call your friends. I hated that movie. Why? The ending. Of course, they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish because you're talking about it long after you leave the movie. We want things tied up. We want things to come to a nice end. We, we want things to be wrapped up. We want to understand everything. And then we have the Gospel of Mark who doesn't seem to have the same pressure that we feel to have it all wrapped up. This is a very bad ending to the Gospel of Mark. It's a very clumsy way to end it. And when you finish reading the story, you're mad. You want Mark to tell you more. You're so mad you tell all your friends. And we've been doing that for 2,000 years. The Gospel of Mark, beginning with chapter 16. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus. And very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying one to another, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb for us? And then looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the, on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's gone ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there just as he told you. And they went out and ran from the tomb, because trembling and, ast and ast astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. And they ran out from the tomb, because trembling and astonishment had overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Like the women, we come early this morning to a tomb that is empty and trying to figure out what happened. We pray 
that as you confirmed your resurrection to them, that you would do so in these moments to us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. See what I mean? Isn't this the most frustrating ending to anything that you've ever seen? I mean, this is the greatest story that has ever been told. And Mark is a great storyteller. He has been leading us up to this moment. And now we come to chapter 16, the resurrection. Jesus is alive. And where's Jesus? The main character. He's not even in the scene. He's gone. We start Easter late. The women get there too late. He's already, do you know we do not have one story of anyone who believed the resurrection? Now listen to what I'm saying. We do not have anyone who thought that Jesus would actually be raised from the dead. The disciples weren't there. They were hiding. They thought it was over. The women did not come to witness the resurrection. They came to complete the funeral. It was called off due to life, but (laughs) no one believed. And then Mark gives us this story, eight verses. This is the story. Three women coming to a tomb, wondering how they're going to get into the tomb in the first place. Now you think they would have thought of that before they got there. But they were so messed up from all that had happened. They were so confused. They just wanted to get this thing done. They wanted it finished. And when they get there, the tomb is open. Mark tells us there's a guy dressed in white. He doesn't even say angel. Some of your translations say angel, but Mark doesn't say angel. He just says guy dressed in white. We don't know who this guy is. He could have been the pizza delivery man. We don't know. I want Mark to tell me. I want wings. If there's an angel, I want wings. Nothing. Just a guy sitting there where Jesus was. And they're astonished. Don't be afraid, he tells them. Too late. Have you ever noticed in the Bible when God says, don't be afraid, when Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's always too late? I'm already afraid. I'm looking in there and we don't know what's going on. Here's what we know. Jesus was dead. Jesus was stone cold, dead as a doornail, dead. The Roman soldiers were professional killers. If they had had any doubt in their mind that Jesus was not totally and completely dead, they would have finished the job. They would have stabbed him with a spear. They would have broken his legs. They would have stabbed him again with a sword. They would have made sure Jesus was dead, and they were confident he was dead. They knew that Jesus had been buried. They watched it. They saw them seal the tomb so nobody could get in it. And now here they are looking at the place where Jesus was. And they're overcome. Uh, The the words that that, that Mark uses has to do with that emotion of where you are surprised and shocked, scared and excited all at the same time and you don't know what to do. You don't know where to run or stay still. You don't know where to fight or or you, you just don't know. It's one of those times where you're just overwhelmed and you kind of freeze. That's how these women are now feeling. And here's what they know. Jesus is gone and the tomb is empty. Go tell the disciples he's waiting on them. He's waiting in Galilee just like he promised. And tell Peter. Now can you imagine if you were Peter? Now the last time we have the story of Peter, he is falling, uh, failing Jesus. He is uh, falling on his face. He is denying that he even knows Jesus and cursing to make his point. He is, he is crumbling under the intense interrogation of a teenage girl. And that's the last we have of Peter. And now the women come and say, guys, Jesus is waiting for you in Galilee, right back where it all started. And and Pete, he's looking for you. 
Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Big music. And that's all we know. Jesus is gone. Jesus isn't buried anymore. Jesus will not stay in the grave. And that's not the last time we have tried to bury Jesus, is it? Ever so often a new rage will come in that say, well, Jesus isn't alive. He faked his death. And we'll have a rash of books around Easter because that's when you go buy them. And it'll tell us that Jesus just passed out and when he was in the cold of the tomb, he came back to consciousness and he walked out of the tomb, somehow pushed over this heavy stone that had been sealed, got by the guards, found Mary Magdalene, married her, and they moved to the south of France. That I'm not making that up. That is a real theory that is out there. But he won't stay buried, will he? Over and over again, the world will tell us that the church is declining, the church is going away. And over again, we find that there, there are millions of believers all over the world. And maybe the church is declining in North America, but it's exploding in China. It's exploding in Africa. It's exploding in South America, Latin America. Listen, if God, if you won't let God work someplace, you'll find some place that will let Him work. One monkey doesn't stop the show. And just because America is in a crisis of belief doesn't mean the church is struggling. Not at all. He won't stay buried. He's on the move. You know, we think, a lot of scholars worry that this is not the true ending of Mark. Uh, you know, the scrolls were put together and literally you would paste one piece of parchment to another and you would, and you would have this long sheet and you would roll it up. And they think that maybe the last page of the parchment fell off somewhere. So they added this other ending. 9 through 20 is a later writing that they put on there. What we really have from Mark is 16, 1 through 8, what we read this morning. And people are angry because that's no way to end the book. And so they tried to add an ending to it. Or maybe, maybe Mark told us everything we needed to know. Everything we need is in those first eight verses. And the whole thing comes down to the witness of three scared women. Now, ladies, don't get mad. Do not email me. I'm just trying to give you the cultural context, okay? In the day that this book was written, women could not testify in court. Women were not considered to be reliable witnesses. Don't email me. I'm just telling you. If you had a case where the only witness was a woman, you had no case at all. One of the reasons that theologians think that the, the story is accurate is because Mark would never make up a lie this bad. If he was going to tell a false story, he would not have women being his first witnesses. He would have more credible witnesses in the eyes of his readers. But the three women have the message, and it's the three women who go and tell the disciples, this is what's going on. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He took our sin into the tomb with him, but he did not bring the sin back out. What he brought out was new life, a second chance. And he's going back to the place where it all started. Remember, remember Peter? Remember when I first walked on the shores of Galilee where you were fishing and I called you? Do you remember when you followed me? You didn't get it the first time. Let's try it again. I told you who I was. You didn't get it. I told you what would happen. You didn't believe me. I told you what the Roman soldiers would do and what my enemies would have done to me. And you said it would never happen. 
Now you didn't get it at all. So let's go back to the place where it started and let's start again. One more time. I'm going to walk on those shores of Galilee. I'm there. Will you come follow now? Now that you know, now that you've seen, will you come follow again? It's John that tells us what happens when Jesus and Peter get together on those shores of Galilee. You remember the story? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I do. Feed my sheep. And he asked Peter three times. Three times Peter had denied him. Three times Peter affirms his love for Jesus. Each time Jesus answers, feed my sheep. Let's go back. Let's start again. I'm going to give you one more chance. One more chance. How many chances do you get? I don't know. That's always a big argument, isn't it? When is your last chance your last chance? I don't know. Here's what I do know. That this Jesus who was in that tomb so long ago was raised from the dead by the power of God, conqueror of death, conqueror of sin, bringer of new life. And the same risen Jesus is doing what he has always been doing, seeking the lost, releasing the hostages, liberating the captives. I remind you all the time, the good news of the gospel is not that you found Jesus. I always get tickled when people come and tell me I found Jesus. And I remind them Jesus wasn't lost. Jesus found you. You were the one lost. And I don't know where you were when Jesus found you. I, I don't know the, the circumstances, the stories. We all have that story of where we were when we realized that Jesus has now come to us. And you feel just like Peter must have felt. All the times you failed, all the mistakes, all the times you've promised, and nothing has been kept. And now you hear the news. Jesus is alive. And he's looking for you. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And he's looking for you. See the tomb where we laid him. He is not here. He's looking for you. The cross couldn't keep him from coming to you. Death could not hold him from rescuing you. Tell the disciples, tell Peter, tell Mike, tell you, I'm waiting for you. I don't know how many chances you've had in the past. I know you have this chance. I don't know how many chances you will have in the future. I just know you have this chance. Jesus is alive. You have one more chance. Let's pray together. With your head's bowed and your eyes closed, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to embarrass you. But some of you are sure that you are so far away that not even Jesus can get to you. Death couldn't hold him back. Neither will anything else. The good news is that Jesus has come. He's looking for you. Right here, right now. This is not a story about how many times you've messed up. It's not a story about how many times you have failed. It's a story about a Jesus who will not be hindered from getting to you, who won't let anything stop him. And now he's here. 
Perhaps it's for forgiveness. For, for, perhaps it's for healing. Perhaps it's for your salvation. And you, now this is the time for you to know. Our ministers will be at these prayer stations at the front. They'll be in the table in the back in the atrium. Big sign says, next step. Don't leave here not knowing what this Jesus looking for you means and the difference it can make. You come. Jesus is waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open before you, every heart. So we pray now that the choices we make are exactly what you want. Would you stand with me? We're gonna have this moment of response to the message and to our resurrected Lord, our altars are open, ministers are at the prayer stations. Next steps are ready for you. You move in obedience to the Lord as we sing together. resurrection of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, may you have reign and dominion and rule over us. Your kingdom come in us as we go. Thank you, Father, for this time to praise your name. We worship you all week long. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you as you go to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>